Hey guys, welcome to Cricket Fanatics Magazine. This is your daily show. I'm your host, Khalid Moirin. This is my co-host, Aditya. And we're here today with Alfred Advice. You guys will know him, internationally renowned journalist, I say. And I mean, you guys will have read his, his articles all over the world from wherever you are. So um, I thought it would be very fitting seeing that um, South Africa and Sri Lanka currently with a tour. It's very fitting to get someone like Talford on the show and have a discussion about everything South African cricket. Uh, Talford, welcome to the show. It's your first time, obviously, on this particular platform, on this particular show. Um, so, so welcome. How are you doing and how's, how's everything going currently? Thanks very much, Khaled. Yeah, the, things, are, things are good. Uh, things are much better in my hood than they are when you consider things like the SJN and, and things yeah. like that. So, um, all good here. I trust you are as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the SJN is something we're going to be speaking about today. But let's just start with, um, I just want to get some insight into into your life a little bit, just a, a brief um, overview and summary of it. I just want to know some of the, the positives and struggles that you've went through as a journalist, a young journalist coming into the industry. And maybe you can name some of the top tours that you've had um, covering the Proteus over the years. It's been a long time since I was a young journalist. Um, but um, yeah, I've been a, a sports journalist, cricket journalist, primarily since 1991, and I can tell you that it's uh, it's much better than having a real job. Um, you know, you you get to write about um, a game that is very writable. Um, I should tell you, I'm not much of a cricket person actually. I'm quite ambivalent about cricket as a sport, which I think helps me because I don't get caught up in 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 needless prejudices. You know, I can I can look at something quite objectively and I can write about it. And I think cricket is a very writable game. Um, it's, 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 because there's so many gaps is, and you've got to fill in those gaps. It's not like rugby or football where you cover those and I've covered rugby and football and you get home and th put on the highlights because you haven't a clue what actually happened in the game. <laughs> Whereas cricket is, cricket is not like that. Cricket, yeah. it, it allows you, it invites you to watch it and to make your own assumptions and make your own opinions and, and, and if you're in the happy position of being a cricket writer, to write about it. <clears throat> so... You know, that's what draws me to cricket is is the writability of it. The cricket itself is like the frame around the picture. Um, what I'm really writing about is human beings and the, and the human condition, if you like. Um, like I said, I've been a cricket writer since 1991. My first tour was to the West Indies in 1992. Um, and, and that opened a lot of eyes um, for, you know, opened my eyes quite wide. And then probably the next very important thing that happened was the King Commission, the Hatsi Kronier Match Fixing Investigation where I really grew up as a cricket writer because I realized this thing wasn't just about runs and wickets and taking catches and dropping catches. It was about a lot more. It was the real world reached cricket and it became much more interesting for me from then. Um, I've covered every World Cup since 2003. And of course, those become their, you know, their own dynamics. Um, they become their own animals. Uh, I've done three tours to the West Indies. Um, I've done a fair few tours to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. India, England, Australia. The only place I haven't been is Pakistan, um, and I would dearly like to get there one day if we're talking about test playing countries. And now that we're talking about it, well, there's Afghanistan hmm. and, uh, and, and also <laughs> Ireland. So and things have changed in at least one of those countries. It's going to be interesting to watch. It's going to be interesting to watch if, if their participation in Afghanistan at the T20 World Cup, should they even be let in, is, is, is I think a pertinent question, considering what they're representing right now. So, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's more or less me. Yeah, excellent. Um, so let's talk about uh, South Africa. They're currently on the tour to Sri Lanka and we've had countless um, shows talking about off the field things that have been happening that I feel is going to really could stain their performances in Sri Lanka or it could amplify them as a team and make them in a, into a better performing team going into it. But uh, there's a lot that you've spoken about, um, some excellent articles you've written as well about this particular incident, especially the SJN hearings, as well as um, things that have happened with Mark Boucher. So how do you think this will affect the team? We've, we've obviously seen Temba Bavuma's press conference. He's talking about what he felt about the situation. But what is your take on everything? And, and since news has broken over the, the last couple of months about this? I think it can't not affect the team. It has to have an effect. And, and there's one big reason why it has to have an effect is because the coach is implicated. You know, if the coach was somebody else, if, if, if Mark Bacher had not been the coach and then the coach was Enoch Inque or, or, or Jeff Toyana and there was nobody in that dressing room connected to all this, then I don't think it would have had much of an effect, quite honestly. Um, it, they would have known about it and it would have been there, but it would have been a background thing. It would have been something from the past. And aren't we lucky that we are now building a better future? But they can't do that now. 
Um, I wrote a piece yesterday saying when, when Mark Boucher's players look across the dressing room, do they see someone who is trying to make a better future for all? Because he is trying now. There's no doubt about that. He's part of this new culture and he is trying. Or do they see somebody who was implicated in racism? And I think that's really a key question for the, 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 the current crop of players. What do they see when they see Mark Boucher now? Um, and, you know, we, we won't know that. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why we won't is that CSA seemed to have taken a decision not to have any press conferences in the lead up to this test series. Um, yes, Timber Bavuma is up um, because he has to be. Uh, the day before the game, um, or a player, or the, generally it's the captain, has to be out. But, you know, they've been sending out audio and video files, which are very useful to journalists, but you don't get the chance to ask, how is this affecting you? And I don't know whether that's a conscious decision not to have any press conferences, or if it's just panned out that way. I'm not going to try and, you know, make a conspiracy here. But I think it has to it has to be there in, in, in some form. And, you know, and, and also, of course, Graham Smith is the, the director of cricket. Okay, he's not central to team operations but these things will be there for those players they have to be uh, hi Devlin. first of all welcome to the show again uh, thank you you know we've we've heard some uh, some seriously gut-wrenching testimony over the last couple of weeks and you know once everyone implicated has had a chance to respond someone somewhere is going to say you know, let's move on. And my question is, what direction will South African cricket move move on in? And uh, what do you think is going to happen over the next couple of weeks or months uh, with with respect to these testimonies? We're not going to have world peace. I can tell you that in the next weeks or months. Um, it's um, uh, look, nobody can really say what's going to happen. But the, the I think a better answer is that it's already happening. There is a lot of public discussion. There is a lot of impotent rage also, you know, coming out, uh, I have to say, from uh, the, the quarters of, of black and brown people. You know, there's a lot of shouting. Um, and I, I would be shouting as well if I was black and brown, absolutely. I'm shouting as a white person, actually, uh, because these are terrible things to come out of, of the past, uh, cricket's past in this country. But we also cannot be surprised. You know, we came out of, a, of 400 years of, of racist, oppressive, systems and 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 we just expect all that to go away it's not going to go away i think people are angry also because they look at that team and they think this team represents us and so what is this team representing if this is how they used to behave you know and 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 it's a complicated thing because i think a lot of those people who are asking that question probably go yeah i've been guilty of similar things so this team is actually representing me, but I don't want them to be this team that's representing me because they're showing up an ugly picture. And for a lot of white people, they're looking in the mirror and, and, and they don't like what they see. And for black and brown people, they're angry and they should be angry. White people should also be angry. A lot of white people are angry. Um, but what do you do with that anger is the question. You know, do, do you just get rid of everybody who's, who's implicated in this? That to me is quite infantile. Because you're being like a kid who sees a scary picture and closes his eyes and says, okay, it doesn't exist. If we can't see the racists, does that mean they don't exist? But you can't just leave it also and, and just say, fine, it's fine. You've apologized. Now let's move on. Um, I think there has to be much more to it than that. I think it needs to be a continuous conversation. You're not going to get rid of racism in South African cricket or any sector of South African society simply by removing the racists. It doesn't work like that. So what do we do? It's a much more complex thing. I think Mark Boucher has, we know, sent in his 14-page submission to the SJN, which is, as uh, I was on a radio show with Lester Kibbert the other day, and he said it's a 14-page lawyer's letter. And that's exactly what it is. You can see it. I, I've known Mark Boucher for a long time. He didn't have much to do in the writing of that thing. I can tell you that. It's, it's legalese. It's, it's this and that and that. And there's some unfortunate phrases in there about uh, prejudice or, or, or racial abuse, abuse, real and perceived. I mean, you can't say that to people. You're just going to make them more angry. Um, but there is also, there's a lot of apology, there's a lot of, um, this is what we're doing now, there's a lot of, we arrived here in this team in the late 90s, 1997 in Boucher's case, and, and there was no preparation for this new deal. And he's right, but also, you know, how you, you need to be able to see this culture is wrong. And, and also what I would like to say is Mark Boucher didn't create that faulty culture. You know, it was there when he arrived. The problem is that, is that Mark Boucher's generation, not Mark Boucher on his own, but Mark Boucher's gen generation of white players didn't change that culture, didn't make it a better culture. That's the real problem. Um, you know, Paul Adams played 18 games for South Africa before Paul, before Mark Boucher even made his debut. So it's it's you can't lump this on Boucher. The problem is he's now the national coach. 
and something there has to be consequences for what happened in the past. So I think it's already happening. I think there's a lot of discussion, and this is healthy. This has to happen. People are saying, when is this going to end? Can we get the politics out? No, we can't get the politics out. Politics can never be out. And the people who are trying to take the politics out, they're part of the problem. Um, so we can't. We can't take the politics out. We must not. Because if you want a better game, if you want a better society, you've got to keep talking about these things and also do something about it. Now, what do we do? That is the tough question. I'm not sure what we do. We look at, I think, in the first place, you've got to get people like Boucher and Graham Smith to actually go to the SJM and attend the hearings. And, and it's one thing to hand in your 14 pages and have no questions asked. It's another thing to sit there and, and, and the advocate and, and the other lawyers are going, what about this? What about this? What about that? I think then we'll get a clearer picture of how bad Boucher's involvement was, for instance, in the case of Boucher. Smith needs to go as well. And there are all sorts of other people who were also involved in that era. Um, you know, and, and Neil McKenzie, the, the CSA's batting lead, also played in that era. So did Victor Patang, who is the, um, the chairman of selectors. Um, he also played in that era. So it's, it's, it's not a simple thing. You know, Herschel Gibbs played in that era. So if this is not a simple black-white thing. And I would imagine is that people of all colors would have been singing uh, the, the song connected now to, to Paul Adams. I can only imagine, it must have been horrible if you were a black or a black, brown player and you're expected to sing that, can you imagine? That's its own special nightmare. But this is quite a complex thing, and what we do from here, I think, is still an unanswered question. Uh, you know, that brings me to my next question, which is that uh, Bowser's document stated that that back in the day, it what a lot of that conduct didn't seem to be offensive, but in hindsight, it is. How do, how do we grapple with that question? You know, how do we, uh, what do we do about it? Because it's, you know, we understand that over time, perhaps the rules of social engagement change. And with hindsight, you have uh, a better idea of what your conduct in the past was. But what do we do about that? You know, Paul Adams has hinted at education. Uh, but what's your view? You know, what can society do? What can cricket do? I think we need to just get a proper understanding of, 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 uh, the atmosphere and that culture. Um, and it seems to be, I mean, I wasn't in those dressing rooms, but it seems to have been the culture of insulting everybody. You know, Mark Barcher was called an insulting that with racial connotations. Um, I imagine just about everybody in that team was, maybe not always with racial connotations. But the difference is, if you're white in that team of the 90s and, and 2000s, and even now, you have the power. You know, I know we supposedly live in a democracy where everyone has the vote, but when I look up, all the poor people I see are, are black or brown, and all the people with money are white. Not all the people with money, but I've never, uh, I've yet, I haven't seen too many white people who are, are as poor as the black and the brown people I see. And that's just the fundamental thing. And in that dressing room, you could insult each other, but when you walked out of that dressing room, you were still a white person. You still walked back into your world where things were wonderful. If you were a black or a brown person, you walked back into your world where things were not wonderful. And, and, and that's a crucial difference because then, you know, you get into this dressing room where you think we're all equal here, black and white, we're playing for South Africa, isn't it wonderful? And then you get insulted as well. <laughs> you know, it just becomes part of your, your daily nightmare rather than, rather than escape from your black or brown world where supposedly we're a democracy, but you still don't have anything to eat. Uh, you know, so I think, I think that is the culture. The, the, I can imagine the white players of that era going, we are united because we're all insulting each other. I know it sounds very juvenile. We're all insulting each other. We're all calling each other by racially dodgy terms and whatnot. And I can imagine what they're saying, this, is, this makes us unified. But they're not understanding that there's a real world out there where this may be a silly song in here, but out there, that could get me killed if I'm not white. And, and I don't think the white players of that era understood that. Cricketers are very limited individuals, actually. They're good at playing cricket. They're not often good at much else. Never mind thinking politically or running a business, things like that. So it's it's this is all part of that dynamic. Um, where it goes from here, how do we, you know, how do we make it better? Yes, education is obviously you need to educate people, but also, you know, you can't. I refuse to believe there's a white person in South Africa who does not know that there is racism um, in 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 their society. That's just impossible. How can you not know that? You go to a restaurant. All the waiters are black. A lot of the, the, the patrons are going to be white. Just look at that. You know, that's just, it's an obviousness. Um, so, yes, we need education. We also need our broader, broader society to become 
better. There needs to be less privilege. You need to, you know, when you see people looting on the TV, as we saw a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, it shouldn't be a case of look at those animals. It should be a case of, yo, there are really poor people in this country, and why so many? And this is the desperation. And you know, I happen to live in a, a very affluent part of Cape Town, um, and 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 it's just like the, the disparity is is shocking. So this cricket argument is part of a much much bigger thing. Education, yes, but just uh, some honesty from white people would be good. It's like, why do we have so much and they have so little? Why is that? And I think that cricket is only part of that. Um, and, you know, when you look at it that way, uh, I'm not sure that I can see white South Africans getting on board with that kind of conversation or in, in, in numbers that they should do uh, very easily. Talford, that was very, very insightful. And thanks, it moved a, moved a lot inside of me as well. Now, thinking about all of this, I mean, we will be doing a lot more shows about this going forward. Um, I want to put a lot of um, spotlight on this and, and focus on this because we want to also hear what, what is what has been said at the SJA and hearings as well so that we can give a holistic view. And I would obviously love you to come on board with that in the future and if we do another massive show with everybody on board. But thanks a lot for giving us your time and, and, and putting so much effort into, into showing the story and telling these stories because we need this out there in the world. So thanks a lot for tuning in, everybody. And um, we'll see you guys again tomorrow with another daily show. Um, take care.